Good afternoon and welcome everyone. Uh, we at the Asian Studies Network want to thank you all today for joining, this, uh, joining us to discuss the current situation in Hong Kong. Our network's goal is to enhance knowledge and understanding of the Asia region and to support and promote research and thinking on Asia in the security, economic, political, social, and cultural spheres. I am Rosette Gagnon-Mélanger, an associate member of the Asian Studies Network under the Center for International Policy Studies here at the University of Ottawa and your moderator for today's event. I am especially interested in the situation in Hong Kong as I studied law at City University of Hong Kong a couple of years before demonstrations began. Now we are delighted today to have Professor Michael Davis and activist Nathan Law to provide us with their insights on the current situation in Hong Kong, how it began and where the situation is heading. Before we turn to our panelists, I wanna encourage you to submit your questions through the Q&A function uh, in Zoom during their presentations. Each panelist will speak for approximately 12 to 15 minutes before we open the floor for questions. I will then ask the questions received through the Q&A to our experts. If you know who you want to ask, please include it in your question. Without further ado, I'm, I want to introduce to you Professor Michael Davis. Long a public intellectual in Hong Kong, he was a professor in the law faculty at the University of Hong Kong until late 2016. Currently, Professor Davis is a global fellow at the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars in Washington, DC, and an affiliate research scholar at the US Asia Law Institute at New York University. In 2014, Amnesty International, the Hong Kong Journalists Association, and the Hong Kong FCC awarded him a Human Rights Press Award for his commentary in the South China Morning Post on the 2014 Hong Kong Umbrella Movement. Finally, and most recently, he published in November 2020, a book entitled, Making Hong Kong China, The Rollback of Human Rights and the Rule of Law. Professor Davis is a highly distinguished scholar on human rights in Asia and an expert on the national security law passed in 2020 in Hong Kong. Professor Davis, the floor is yours. Thank you for, for your kind introduction, and I much appreciate that I'm uh, able to join this session in Ottawa in this age of COVID, when we can speak all over the world without going leaving our, our bedroom. So uh, what I can do here in 12 minutes, I think, is just kind of bullet point some of the things that concern us. Uh, what I would say as an overall statement is that China's takeover of Hong Kong is so comprehensive uh, that it, it's it, it's almost impossible to appreciate it without uh, being there in person and feeling the heavy weight of, of what's happening. Uh, the two major sorts of steps that China took that problem that are sort of the focus of our action today uh, would be the passage of a national security law uh, last year, and then this year, the, uh, even today, the NPC Standing Committee uh, issued uh, amendment to the basic law annexes for the electoral process in Hong Kong. So these things are, are what I want to talk about. I, I, I should preface it just briefly by noting that Hong Kong was really, if you look at the basic law of Hong Kong and the Sino-British Treaty of many years ago, Hong Kong was promised a liberal constitutional order with the ultimate aim of full democracy. Uh, it's an open society. It's been ranked among the most open societies with the highest levels of uh, freedom in the world. With the, it's been ranked among the top in the world on the rule of law and so on. When people have protested in Hong Kong, Beijing likes to claim, well, we're justified in imposing all these things on Hong Kong because of the protest. That assumes that people just got up and protested for no reason. In fact, they were protesting against Beijing's continuing sort of intervention in Hong Kong and dragging its feet over carrying out its promises on Hong Kong. People of Hong Kong were wise enough to recognize that the situation they faced 
was one where Hong Kong's freedoms would be lost, where its rule of law would not be defended because there was no government in place representing the people of Hong Kong. So this is the situation. One of the most hardline regimes in the world uh, promised that it would allow Hong Kong to remain an open society, and it broke that promise. And so that's why the protest. So if we would like, I guess, Beijing and the Hong Kong government to ask themselves why people were uh, protesting and what it was they were concerned about, but there's been no sign of that. In fact, the opposite has been done. So last year they passed this national security law the Hong Kong basic law says mainland departments will not interfere in Hong Kong. Mainland laws will not apply in Hong Kong. All that went out the window last year. They passed this law. They set up a mainland office on national security with secret police from the mainland brought into Hong Kong from the Public Security Bureau on the mainland and from state security. Uh, they set up a committee in Hong Kong uh, that's to oversee this, uh, headed by the chief executive. And both this committee and the Office for Safeguarding National Security are not subject to review by the courts. So they're in effect above the law, the rule of law is put in jeopardy by these bodies. And then under the committee in Hong Kong, they created special branches of both the police and the justice department. And, and so the national security law then created a kind of Hong Kong secret police on national security. And these secret police have used their power They've charged almost the entire opposition in Hong Kong with crimes, uh, violation of the national security law, both people, prominent people in the media and, and literally all the opposition candidates that wanted to be nominated. They, they organized a primary uh, for the election that was supposed to take place late last year. And these people are all under arrest now and in jail. So when you think of places like Myanmar, where the military behave in such a overwhelming way to suppress people, you would think this could never happen in one of the most open cities, cities in the world, a city often compared to New York and London. Instead, all of these things have happened. And then uh, that wasn't enough. All the opposition put under arrest, uh, so many different little steps taken along the way, vetting people, uh, disallowing candidates, throwing people like my colleague here, Nathan Law, out of the legislature, all of these things going on along the way, inspiring protest and public concern. But then they want now to control who can run for office. So they issued these two amended annexes today. And it's stunning when you look at the annexes that they've issued, they, they look almost as long as the basic law. I haven't measured them, but they're certainly long and complicated. And what you see in it is a comprehensive effort by Beijing to ensure that all the people in what's called an election committee, the election committee is going to vet all candidates for public office in Hong Kong. It's been expanded from 1200 to 1500. And some of the sections, there, there are 300 people, uh, members of the committee in each section. And these sections all have to approve candidates for the legislative council. It used to be this election committee was used to choose the chief executive to ensure Beijing got a chief executive that it wanted. But now all of the legislature is this way. And this election committee now, the, the legislature in Hong Kong up until recently was 70 members, about half of them directly elected and a half from functional sectors, okay? Uh, democratic reform in Hong Kong always meant shrinking the functional sectors and expanding direct election. But what happened today in this decision of the standing committee is the legislative council is now expanded to 90 members and 40 of them are gonna be elected by this election committee. And then today they also designated under the, both these annexes, one annex deals with the chief executive, one with the legislature, a new review committee that has to, it's going to be, we're told, we don't have the details of it yet, but we're told it'll be under 10 members, basically senior pro Beijing figures uh, that are going to be uh, chosen by these committees that were set up under the national security law. And, and then this committee itself is going to have to vet every candidate for office. So the election committee I just discussed is not enough. 
They're going to have this separate vetting committee. And all of this, the election, uh, the uh, uh, Committee on Safeguarding National Security under the National Security Law, the Office for Safeguarding National Security under the National Security Law, the election committee decisions, the vetting committee decisions, none of them are subject to review in the courts. All of them make final decisions. All of them are heavily stacked with probaging figures. One of the things that's stunning to me when go going over this this morning, and I called about it almost immediately after it was passed at six o'clock in the morning my time, one of the things in looking at it, it was it's so complicated that it's almost a violation of human rights because ordinary voters who, who participate in any level in this process will, will not know what they're doing. They will not know what's going on. Even the functional sectors, more than half of them, are only going to be chosen by corporate voters. Corporations can vote for those functional sectors. So if you take 90 members of the Legislative Council, 40 of them from this Beijing-friendly uh, election committee that's stacked heavily with that, and it also has its own functional sectors, for the election committee, a lot of the functional sectors have to be people who are members of mainland approved committees that operate on the mainland. So this election committee in the past, when it was 1,200 members, about 80% would be pro-Beijing, 20% pro-opposition. Uh, now I would say even more percentage is going to be pro-Beijing because there's this hugely complicated process we're sorting them out. And then finally, just to make sure everything is, you know, there's an old saying that was given back when Hong Kong was handed over, that Beijing doesn't mind holding elections as long as it knows the outcome ahead of time. Well, in this case, they will surely know the outcome ahead of time. I sound like I'm uh, agitated, I am. I sound like I'm exaggerating, I'm not. This is really what's happening. And, and I, I, you know, laying it out in 12 minutes, it was certainly a challenge. I don't know if I've used all my 12 minutes, but if I have a minute or two left, I can stay. Then there's a question, what do the rest of us do about it? Now, I've testified in the Canadian Parliament before, and one of the things I know uh, people listening to this are concerned about is, can you help Hong Kong in any way? And I think Nathan will have something more to say about this, but certainly questions about immigration and access. I mean, Canada, you know, this could be your lucky day, this tragedy for Hong Kong, because if you get more Hong Kongers immigrating to Canada, it will only be to Canada's benefit, because we're talking about people from one of the most successful financial centers in the world. There's a lot of talent in Hong Kong. I think a lot of people are going to be very concerned about, about these things that I've discussed. So one of the things that people in terms of solution will be looking at is whether you can be helpful in any way uh, for uh, Hong Kong people who may find the situation under the national security law threatening or the way Hong Kong is to be run, uh, perhaps in their view, destroying the very thing, the very city uh, that they identify with the situation and the people that they are. So this is the kind of thing we're talking about. So that's one form of response. There have been other forms of response and I'm sure Nathan uh, is more on top of this than I am, but we know there have been use of sanctions and so on. Uh, and I guess governments are going to have to figure out uh, what they're going to do in this regard. Because one of the things, and I'll close with this, one of the things that underlies all of this is when the Sino-British Joint Declaration was signed and when the basic law was issued, the Chinese government asked the governments of the world to treat Hong Kong distinctly and to recognize Hong Kong as a special administrative region. And they did this based on the original promises that were made. But now governments are going to be told, well, you're interfering in Hong Kong's internal affairs. In fact, the statements when these, these documents were issued was that no one else has a right to comment on this. Well, everyone else was asked to recognize Hong Kong distinctly. And they certainly have an interest in what's going on in Hong Kong. And I think they share it with the Hong Kong people. And they share it not only in these legal terms, but they share it in their admiration and respect for this great city.
And I'll close with that. And I'm open for any questions. Uh, I, there's a lot more to say. As, as uh, Rosette pointed out, I wrote a book on this. So, so that I encourage you to read it. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Professor Davis. It's definitely complex and there's so much more that will come out shortly about what was just uh, passed today by the standing committee. And I'm sure we will also be looking at uh, the interviews you mentioned about this as well. Yeah. Um, now, thank you very much. Now let's turn over to um, Nathan Law. So Nathan Law is a Hong Kong activist who is currently studying at Yale University for a master's degree in East Asian studies. During the Umbrella Movement in 2014, Nathan was one of the five representatives who took part in a dialogue with the government debating political reform. In 2016, along with other student leaders, he co-founded uh, an organization called Demosisto, a pro-democracy political organization. Finally, in the 2016 Legislative Council election, and as was mentioned by Professor Davis, Nathan Law became the youngest elected legislative councillor in history. His seat was, however, later overturned following a constitutional reinterpretation. Less than two weeks after the national law was passed in Hong Kong, Nathan Law fled to London in fear of being imprisoned. As um, Professor Davis, uh, many, many activists were arrested. The latest number um, presented in the media was 47. As a Hong Kong activist, Nathan provides a unique perspective on the recent uprising in Hong Kong and retains access uh, to the latest developments on the ground. Nathan, the floor is yours. Thank you so much for the introduction, Rosette. And um, thank you so much for the invitation from um, the Institute. I'm Nathan. And um, I think, uh, first of all, um, Professor Davis has um, explained the situation of the current political reform imposed by the Chinese Communist Party very clearly. And if we take a look at the current situation in Hong Kong, first we have the national security law, which our freedom of expression association are all being quashed. And we have a political reform that um, our participation in election becomes meaningless. Uh, basically there will be no fair and free election. Our electoral system has gone a big step backward in terms of um, the openness and the degree of demo uh, democratic uh, participation. And uh, for now, people are just leaving the city, uh, brains are draining, and we are seeing a much more authoritarian and, uh, well, uh, authoritarian city with so much uh, pol uh, uh, political control and police violence and brutality. So we are really, we are seeing the fall of Hong Kong and it, it it doesn't come in a day or in a glimpse. There has been a big backdrop behind all this deterioration. And from my point of view, my personal story, actually um, each stage that I've been through for the past seven years of activism signifies certain erosion uh, along the way. So I was, I was first uh, involved in a uh, student movement in 2014. By then I was the head of my um, student union. And I, as Rosette just laid out, I was one of the student leader in, in the 2014 umbrella movement. But then it was the very first uh, massive civil disobedient occupation in Hong Kong's history. It marked a uh, landmark um, civil disobedient movement. And all of us, uh, we were fighting for a universal suffrage. And at, at the time when the Occupy Central and umbrella movement was proposed, there was a certain hope that we can kind of overturn the government's trajectory on closing down our freedom and achieving uh, the aim of uh, universal suffrage of the chief executive election and also um, for the legislative council election in 27, uh, 2016 and 2017. So by then there was still a hope of that, even though the, the, the umbrella movement failed um, and a lot of uh, following prosecution emerged but at the end of the day, we didn't really see the, the, the current Hong Kong coming. And along the way, I was uh, elected in 2016. I was privileged enough to be involved in uh, possibly the very last uh, meaningful legislative council election in 2016. And, um, but my seat was overturned uh, in 2017. So you could really see that the suppression from the government, they are really 
uh, upscaling the way that they could prosecute and to suppress people. They can intervene the, in the election result by interpreting our constitution and imposing this persecution um, on us and on the people who voted for us. And after a month after my disqualification, I went to jail because of my participation in the umbrella movement. And that was also a landmark case because uh, the Court of Appeal uh, set up a much harsh um, sentencing for an awful assembly and for um, demonstrations that uh, the degree of violence was minimum. And um, they have explained the situation of Hong Kong as uh, there is a trend of civil disobedience so that they have to add um, certain deterrent factor in terms of uh, these political cases. So it, once again, like my encountering in, in the series marked um, another phase of Hong Kong's history. And we, we've been witnessing a lot of these deterioration along the years. And for now, um, I'm an exile activist. I, I left Hong Kong last June in regards to the upcoming ensuing um, imposition of the national security law. And uh, when I was uh, reading the paper in last August, I realized that I was put uh, on the wanted list. And for now, I am a wanted fugitive under, um, well, uh, under the Hong Kong government that I, in their terms, I am in violation of uh, colluding with foreign forces and committing subversive, subversive acts. And, and the later uh, crime they put on me was exactly the ones that they put on uh, the 47 activists who had involved in the primary last year. Um, they are participants, they're organizers, and most importantly, um, they are the most prominent faces of Hong Kong protest. So for now, uh, basically all the prominent uh, pro-democracy figures, either they are arrested, jailed, or in exile. And that is uh, the situation of Hong Kong's uh, uh, civic society and uh, democratic movement. So for now, as we step into uh, th this current stage, I think um, it's important that we explore and understand how come there has been a drastic change in terms of dealing with Hong Kong from China's perspective, because uh, everyone was, uh, everyone is actually recognizing the first decade of the handover, which was from 19, uh, 1997 to 2007, that was a rather honeymoon period for Hong Kong. Um, the one country, two system, uh, the preservation of freedom and autonomy was largely intact, even though we had a massive uh, demonstration in uh, the year 2003. But after that, uh, we've been through a turbulent period. And for now, basically, as what um, Professor Davis just explained, um, Beijing retained pretty much full dominance and control. And the idea of division of power and freedom are finished in Hong Kong. And I think one of the major reasons why Beijing has that strategic change is uh, the position of Hong Kong is no longer um, uh, similar than the ones they uh, once designed. Um, there are two main reasons for that. First, I think Hong Kong no longer play as a role model for one country, two system, which is actually an example for Taiwan. Um, after the recent two presidential elections, um, the willingness of Taiwanese people are clear. There is no way that China can conduct that peaceful, the, the so-called peaceful reunification, and some see it as an annexation um, in the near future. So basically, the, uh, when Hong Kong was um, kind of like um, getting into the one country system, one country, two system, its initial idea was to set an example for Taiwan. But for now, there is no need for that. And for the second, definitely, is because um, the way that Xi Jinping sees China becomes um, a much different one than uh, previous leaders. Um, Xi Jinping, when he came in power in 20. 12 to 2013, he, he emphasized on um, the path confidence, the confidence doctrine, which is in, uh, indoctrinated in uh, the governing philosophy of him. He sees uh, the, the governing structure of the one party dictatorship and the Chinese characteristic authoritarian model as the way to go. He has the confidence of his system that it is not inferior than democracy. Therefore, they have no intention to demonstrating to demonstrate that 
China is moving towards to a liberalization and democratization uh, direction. And that is exactly what uh, the role of Hong Kong um, under uh, the, 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 under the Chinese Communist regime, Hong Kong was able to retain a certain degree of freedom. And it was a, a kind of like a, a, a reasoning and, and an example and an evidence that China was actually moving towards a more democratic society. But for now, they have the, the path confidence. They no longer have to perform that role. So um, uh, I, I think that is the reason why uh, China, they are, they are like, um, releasing all the uh, shackles and all the restriction on how they intervene and basically destroy Hong Kong civic society and its, its system and to try to mainlandize Hong Kong into just an ordinary Chinese city. So I think uh, after we kind of like have a brief understanding towards, I think it is important that we connect the fate of Hong Kong into um, the the the, globe, the global situation of democracy, especially under the threat of the Chinese expansionist uh, authoritarianism. And I think if we cannot recognize the threat uh, the Chinese Communist Party is posing to the rule-based world system, and also um, the way that they see themselves and climbing the top of the world, basically the situation in Hong Kong is very unlikely to be overturned or reversed, and people will still uh, suffer under this authoritarian state. So I think um, the fate of Hong Kong people is pretty much the fate of democracy around the world. And I think uh, for now, democracies have to work together, together to find some solution and to stop and reverse the uh, global democratic decline for the last two decades. And I think that is uh, a piece of suggestion for me, um, for uh, the policymakers and also the way to help Hong Kong. Um, so I, I think my opening remarks will, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll come to an end and I'm looking forward to your questions. Thank you very much, uh, Nathan, for, for your, your insights in what's happening. Um, we could, we were just talking before this event uh, started and I think this is a, a topic worth discussing and there's a lot that could still be said. So we will turn over to questions. Um, I will, I will turn over, I'll read two to each and uh, we'll go from there. So obviously as um, Professor Davis mentioned in his remarks, um, there are people and it came through the questions as well, wondering how can we help with the situation in Hong Kong? What concrete acts or you know, how can we have an impact from overseas? So I'll, I'll turn that one to, to you, Nathan, to, to begin. And before you start, I will also read another one for um, Professor Davis. Um, yes, yeah, so there's a question came in for Professor Davis. Many activists and academics have pointed to the difficulty of using conventional refugee law and measures in Hong Kong because it is so difficult to leave the country. What legal and practical measures would be most effective to allow viable asylum and refugee claims to Canada? Thank you for the question. I think um, that is the two avenues to think about the question. First of all, the one would definitely how to support Hong Kong directly. And I think um, from a, a perspective of uh, um, like foreigners, um, I think it's important to, uh, to ask for the government for a more comprehensive Hong Kong policy. For example, introducing uh, expedite um, a, a refugee and uh, asylum seeking um, well, pathway for Hong Kong people and also sanctions on uh, Hong Kong officials who are responsible for the human rights violation. That's very important because that is the very few um, tools that we could deploy. And I think uh, the previous um, United sanctions from uh, the global democracies on uh, Chinese officials is a good start and it should be expanded to Hong Kong officials as soon as possible. And the second avenue would definitely be how to address uh, the Chinese global um, authoritarian expansion and I think that is, uh, as I said, uh, that is the core of the global democracy decline and also what's happening in Hong Kong. So I think uh, it's important that we support an assertive China policy, which uh, tends to put human rights in center of uh, the policy making and also make sure that when we engage with China, we have certain human rights precondition that we hope China to achieve before we engage in any meaningful dialogue and also coordinating with 
uh, global democracies to have coordinated actions to be strong and firm in terms of our pursuit and um, persistence on democracy is also important. And I think that is the way that we could reverse the trends and to try to like create some legitimacy and credibility for um, the liberalized order and uh, the democracy so that Hong Kong as um, a, terrible, um, in, a terrible example in such a big backdrop could be benefited from it. Thank you. Um, Professor, yeah. No, I'm not a refugee law expert, so I'm probably not the best person to ask this question to. But my, my, I, I assume the concern is that people are having difficulty, uh, or they anticipate difficulty leaving Hong Kong. We saw the most dramatic case of 12 people going to sea, trying to get to Taiwan. Uh, and it's hard for foreign governments to control that, that circumstance. So those people who are under various uh, charges under law in Hong Kong, uh, probably the, the one thing that, that has been done so far is to uh, cancel uh, the re extradition arrangements with Hong Kong. So people that do get out uh, don't face danger of, of getting back. And, and I think here's an area where there can be consensus building with other countries. Uh, so, you know, because Hong Kongers, uh, like Nathan, uh, we don't want them to have to travel uh, at risk when they leave the country where they're living at, at the moment, uh, so that they, they risk extradition from another country. So I think Canadian government could act with, you know, diplomatically to try to, uh, to cut back on access or ability of China to seize back people. Uh, Another thing that can happen, which the uh, British are essentially doing in, with their BNO passports and their opening up of uh, access to Britain is not just a matter for refugees, that people in general uh, really fear the developments in Hong Kong. People in Hong Kong have all lived in an open society uh, with human rights and the rule of law, uh, most of them for their whole life. Uh, and so giving, uh, facing a future of living under uh, a hardline authoritarian regime is viewed as a very uh, unsatisfactory by many people. So keeping, uh, you know, open access into Canada, uh, not just to people who qualify directly as refugees, but people more generally, I think is something that Hong Kong people would welcome because Canada has long been a prominent destination for Hong Kong people over many years in some Canadian cities, uh, you know, such as Vancouver, but, but really virtually all Canadian cities have large Hong Kong populations. And it's certainly been a great advantage for Canada to have these people. So I think uh, that, that kind of uh, either visa free access or easy access uh, for people, ordinary people that want to come out uh, is also something that's important. Thank you so much, uh, Michael. I read the, the, the questions are coming in, which is good. I'll read you the, the next ones. Um, so this one is for Michael. How concerned are you about the Immigration Amendment Bill 2020 being considered by the, UK, the, the Hong Kong Parliament? Um, and there's another one as well for you, Michael. How do you think, and it's from, uh, sorry, it's from um, Susan Gregson, who uh, was a former um, Kane ambassador to uh, China. How do you think the Hong Kong experience will impact on the PRC plan for reunification with Taiwan? How do you see that playing out over the coming years? And finally, for Nathan, one question from Elizabeth Donkervoor. Uh, who is a professor at the Canadian University. Uh, Nathan, I'm interested in how you see the role of activists in exile, how it complements, enhance, or strengthen the work of activists on the ground, and how to promote collaboration between the various different exile groups that are emerging. Or do you see benefit in those groups remaining separate? So Michael, if you wanna begin. Okay, yeah, so, well, on immigration, I <laughs> prefaced already that it's not my area of expertise, but this bill that has been reported on apparently uh, includes the possibility of, of blocking people from leaving 
uh, you know, at the end of the day, it's it's almost impossible to do anything about it because when you look at the government in Hong Kong today, I mean, Carrie Lam is cheering away at, at uh, all this new uh, electoral laws and they're all excited and happy about the national security laws. So there, I think there's just an attitude within the government that human rights is not a very important concern uh, or that, you know, quote unquote, Western views of human rights are not important. Uh, so uh, I, again, I think it's hard for outside governments to control it on the ground, except obviously some kind of diplomatic pressures and so on. Uh, then both Canada and the United States are using sanctions as tools. Uh, some uh, people have encouraged that those sanctions should be more targeted at corporations and businesses uh, because uh, they are often uh, co-opted. Even now under this new election law, corporations are gonna elect a substantial number of the members uh, of the government, uh, of the legislative council. So uh, if they are so cooperative, maybe there should be some cost for that. But it, this is things that they'll have to look at. Uh, when it comes to Taiwan, uh, I think Nathan has it right. I know, I know we've both been there from time to time. Uh, there's no interest on the ground in Taiwan, really, uh, you know, not a significant number of people interested in, in accepting one country, two systems. And, and we saw in the election uh, in Taiwan, the last election for, for president, that uh, it almost wins the election for uh, the DVP and Taiwan if, if uh, you know, China behaves badly in Hong Kong. So people are watching very much what's going on in Hong Kong. And I think their resistance to being part of China is increasing. Uh, unfortunately, what it seems to come down to next, and, and Beijing seems to threaten from time to time, are military approaches, uh, violent approaches to dealing with Taiwan. Uh, and this becomes a part of the national security uh, challenges uh, that Western democracies face in that region. I, I think uh, it, it speaks for itself. Uh, it's not a direction anybody wants to see uh, in terms of you know, actual war over Taiwan. Uh, but with the Beijing government now that, we're, that you're having to deal with is not really receptive to uh, as we see in Hong Kong, it's not, not receptive to pleas uh, for protecting basic rights and freedoms uh, in a society. So those sorts of pleas made with regard to Taiwan may fall on deaf ears. Uh, I see no way out of it at the moment. Thank you. Nathan? Great. Um, thank you for the question. And um, I think uh, is a good question because um, this is something we have never experienced, or in, at least in Hong Kong's context, uh, we have never experienced uh, such an outflow of exile activists uh, like uh, we had, like we are having now. And it's important that we can navigate a way that we could can continue to raise awareness and continue to um, make Hong Kong under the spotlight so that we can uh, have more attention and more policy around it. And um, I think, uh, first of all, as a, a, a exile activist, we, we are unable to connect to the people on the ground, at least uh, for like activism uh, or cooperation like that, because that may endanger the people on the ground. Um, and they could be branded as colluding with our activities so that they are breaching the national security law. So um, it is a big restriction for our efforts and our campaign. And it's, we, we cannot have that synergy with the uh, activists on the grounds. And on the other hand, uh, a lot of organizations saying exile activists now around the world, including a lot of them are in Canada. Um, they are kind of like born out of the uh, 2019 protest movement, which they really uphold a leaderless, um, spontaneous and be water strategy so that um, on the one hand, or we recognize the power of unity, but on the one hand, if we take the wrong approach or making individual um, or organizations feel pressured or feel uh, feeling uncomfortable to work with, then it will once again hamper uh, the process of each of our, of our own advocacy. So for now, I don't see that is 
a room for an overarching um, organization uh, that kind of like include all the people who are doing advocacy around the world. And I think we need a, a process and, and, and uh, um, a process to build trust, to build confidence and uh, mostly work from a project base so that we can get a feel of who they are and whether they're trustworthy and what their works are focusing. For example, I uh, uh, introduced the Hong Kong Charter um, around a month ago, which it uh, clearly outlines our faith, our beliefs, and um, I, the, and the, the way forward, the way for international advocacy forward from eight of our initiators. I think this is uh, the very first step, at least from my point of view, to kind of like unite people from different backgrounds and to outline clearly what we're thinking, not only to the local audience, but to the world, to the people, to the exile, um, <clears throat> activists, to the diaspora, Hong Kongers, and also policymakers around the world to understand what we're doing and our beliefs. And I think that is the very first step. And, um, and different organizations have different focus. Some of them, like me, I, I really work on efficacy work, awareness raising work, but for the others, they do community building, they engage with uh, Hong Kong, uh, overseas Hong Kong communities, and we have different um, roles to play. So I think uh, it's a very complicated structure and um, situation. And for me, I can only like, uh, well, learn it by doing it. And I, uh, yeah, I think uh, at least we, 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 well, we will have a long road to go um, until we can go back to Hong Kong. So that's time for us to navigate the best way, how we could get it together without um, repeating some of the mistakes that we had. Can, can I add just a, a point to Nathan's uh, point? Uh, when I talked about the national security law, I didn't bring up because of time limitation, but the law is applies worldwide. Yeah. Anybody doing anything under this national security law that is thought to violate it, Myself, Nathan, anyone can be charged, and we, Nathan and I, have friends who are American citizens who have uh, been listed as having warrants for their arrest uh, for their advocacy. And this has a huge implication because it just it doesn't just affect the kind of actions people take, because not everybody wants to risk uh, these things, or some people may want to uh, find a middle ground in their activities but it also Im imposes dangers for even academics and others who want to come and go. I always come and go to Hong Kong, even after I, I spent 30, more than 30 years in Hong Kong. And I teach at the University of Hong Kong. I just did this this past fall. But I think a lot of academics will have fear of going into Hong Kong, those who work in these fields where they openly speak up. And there's so many of them who do. Uh, they, they will not be able to go back and forth. So the dialogue with people on the ground is, is obstructed in many ways, uh, not just among activists, but among scholars, uh, university recruitment in Hong Kong. We don't know what the consequence is going to be of all of this because of the risk that people take uh, there. So it's just something I wanted to add. And I think it's important because a lot of the listeners that we have in today's session uh, may face some of these uh, questions for their own personal life and how they get involved. Thank you so much. Um, it is correct. It applies to non-resident, not just uh, resident, and it is international. So yes. Yeah. Um, moving. I have a few for Nathan that came through. So, okay. Um, yes. So one for, for Michael first, uh, I think you could probably respond this question, talk about this for quite some time, but someone is asking questions about the practical impact of the most recent changes. So I'm, I'm assuming this person is referring to um, today's change that you mentioned earlier. Then for Nathan, I have a couple of questions. So recent reporting indicates that mainland citizens are buying up Hong Kong property. Do you see this as a social mean to contribute to the overthrow or indirect result of a growing economy? Then I had another one. Yeah, I have another one for, for either. Um, how has disinformation by Beijing 
distorted the narrative of what is really happening in Hong Kong for foreign audiences and the broader international community. And then I have one for, and the last one, I have one for Michael, uh, just to kick it a little bit. Um, as you're aware, when the national security law passed, and um, they were people supporting and supportive of it at the Human Rights Council, and there were, there were a group of um, states against it. It was interesting to see that the, the more than 50 states were supportive of the recent national security law, whereas only 27, if I'm not mistaken, were against, which was led by the UK, obviously. So if you have anything that you can discuss on, on this and how there, there is such a massive support for, for, for this law at the, it was at the Human Rights Council. Uh, I guess I'm first, I was asked first. Uh, yeah, the practical effect. I, I was trying to remember the second question that applied to me, <laughs> which applied to both myself and Nathan, but uh, perhaps after I answer the first one, you yeah. can remember. Uh, yeah, the practical effect, I think, is absolutely really blocking opposition from participating in politics. Today's, both the national security law, which basically was used to arrest the political opposition, and now uh, a, a very complicated, convoluted, I should say, uh, electoral uh, paradigm. I mean, it's in the basic law, so it's like a constitutional level, and the Hong Kong government is going to rush around and try to enact local laws, and it's interesting in doing so, uh, they don't have to worry about opposition because they dismiss some of the opposition and the rest got up and left in protest. So the, it's a very uh, placid the legislative council is gonna to try to do this. But the practical effect is to bar all opposition. Uh, they, the government likes to claim that they can still run, they just have to be uh, patriots. Uh, but what they define as patriots is essentially supporting the Communist Party of China. And uh, these opposition figures, any of them of note, uh, who really do not. Most of them have been charged with law violations, uh, and so they would not be approved in any event. I think we can stretch that practical effect. I won't be surprised, and it's sad, that there may be a boycott of elections in the future. I just wonder if this is the case. If you make the obstacles to participation so high that you can't, you can expect you can't do it at all, then what, what is the practical choice left? And this is something uh, the voters and, and you know, political active people are gonna have to decide, not someone here, but in, in under the national security law, they won't even presumably be able to say they're gonna boycott it. <laughs> They'll have to sort of secretly agree to boycott it. I have no idea, but it seems to me that there's nothing left. And then the second question, I liked it and I can't remember what it was, Yes, I'll read it again. Apologies. Uh, the second question, just scrolling down. Oh, um, how has this information by Beijing distorted the narrative of what, what is really happening in Hong Kong for foreign audiences and the broader international community? I think it's referring to how this is actually also impacting people abroad, like you were just discussing. Oh, yeah. I, I, this is an excellent question because what Beijing is doing in promoting these laws is saying, well, look at all the protests on the streets in Hong Kong. If you want to get it, feel it, uh, feel it up close and personal, just think Myanmar today. So look at all of this, this protest and opposition. Who, what government would allow this to happen? But what that question and that way of presenting it, and the government of Hong Kong presents it the same way, what that ignores is that these people of Hong Kong didn't just get up one day and start making trouble. They're reacting to what the government's doing. They're protesting against something specific that's happening to them. And what, what, is, what drove the protest is the government's indifference to concerns that Hong Kong people had. And I think this is really important because it, it, it does kind of sell. And that kind of goes to the last question about support. Of course, Beijing has uh, aligned itself with some governments around the world. It's very active in rewarding its friends and punishing its enemies. And so there are governments that align with Beijing uh, regardless of what, what position it's taking. 
uh, and, and that that's it. But but if the path out, the path to justify it would be these governments thinking, no, no, yeah, we agree with Beijing. We would not tolerate this kind of political protest either. Uh, but, you know, what I line, lay out in this book actually is how Beijing over the 23 years since the handover has slowly uh, activated and radicalized political politics in Hong Kong and left it to street protest as the only way for people to represent themselves. So for them then to blame the street protest they, they themselves created uh, to either sell it to their allies or to sell it to ordinary people uh, is, is uh, very misleading. Thank you very much, um, Michael. Nathan, do you remember the question that you want me to repeat them? <laughs> yeah, I, I've jotted it down. I hope that I, I, I jotted it correctly. Um, so I think the first question is about um, uh, the, the inflow of money, basically inflow of money from uh, yeah. the North to Hong Kong. And I think that, that that is actually a sign of insecurity because um, under the um, Chinese control of uh, the financial markets, and we've heard a lot of incidents of um, their curbing the outflow of money. Actually, Hong Kong has always been the most convenient um, shore for them, uh, for the rich people in mainland China to get their money out uh, because they are afraid of certain uh, economic and political insecur uh, insecurity in mainland China. So I think uh, Hong Kong has always been playing that role. And I think the reason why like the housing market and, and the stock market in Hong Kong has always been going up um, regardless of uh, actually how the economy of the city is, is because it, it, it actually serves a uh, much larger, um, uh, much, much larger population than several million Hong Kong people. Um, it, it, a lot of um, rich people in mainland China, they're getting their money out through Hong Kong. So I think that is, uh, one of the reasons why there will be a, keep in, uh, a constant inflow of a large sum of money from the North. And the second question is about disinformation. I think in general, um, the disinformation launched by CCP affiliated agents um, in terms of the fake narrative of uh, the protest is failing and has been failing. Uh, they are portraying the protest as CIA initiated. Uh, we are a bunch of people were receiving uh, fundings from the West and uh, is about uh, um, color revolution. And that narrative is not selling out in, on an international level. Um, and well, because like Hong Kong, there are lots of international media based in Hong Kong. They reported um, as the genuine as they could. And like many people have received uh, the, the very first hand information about Hong Kong's protest. So I don't think that big narrative won't Hong Kong protests from the Chinese side, uh, just to, that means the information campaign works out. But I think uh, the, the, the impact of that uh, manifest uh, on a rather like individual cases, um, like smearing campaign on me and on other political activists and try to justify and legitimize their suppression by branding us uh, uh, in a way that uh, we are like, they, they have always been uh, using, a, 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 a description of us, even though uh, for some of us, uh, we're not intended to do so, we're completely uh, not uh, in connection of that. Like for example, they, they like to say any pro-democracy uh, uh, um, uh, activists are like um, secessionists betraying their countries, enemy of, of, of the country. They're using that overwhelming uh, and heated uh, extreme nationalism to um, go against our political belief and by branding that and by coercing the other countries not to get in touch with uh, these people who like intervene into the sovereignty of China, um, they actually perform a, a certain uh, a level of smearing uh, the effects of affecting uh, the reputation of the activists on the global level. So I guess uh, that kind of campaign in certain ways they have succeeded um, partially so I guess uh, the, the info, misinformation campaign from China has been um, growing up and become more and more sophisticated. But I think on the other hand, that aggression, uh, the, the wolf warrior diplomacy and, and the pure aggression originated uh, from the Chinese side also actually discredit their uh, narrative and discourse. Um, just look at what uh, the Chinese diplomat said about the Chinese, uh, the, 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 um, 
uh, the, the Canadian government and the leader of the country in, in these recent days and, and the treatment to the two microbes in mainland China. And these things are actually discrediting themselves and making the misinformation campaign less and less effective. So I think um, for now, um, in terms of Hong Kong's narrative, we were still like uh, promoting uh, our, 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 uh, what's really happening on the ground and um, our, our duty is to raise that awareness and try to make um, the outside world understand more about us. Thank you very much. Um, we are getting close to the end, but I have two questions. I want to jump in the last two questions because they seem very interesting. There's one for Michael and there's, sorry, one for Nathan. So for, sorry, I'm just scrolling down. So for, for uh, Nathan, um, Camille is, uh, Camille is asking, I would be curious to know more about the panelists opinion on the milk tea alliance between Hong Kong, Thailand, Taiwan, and Myanmar, and its potential impact influence on the situation in Hong Kong, if any. And for Michael, um, it's regarding the timing of the implementation of the recent laws. Do you think the pandemic has affected the situation in any way or prevented maybe other countries from focusing their attention um, to Hong Kong and also provided uh, an opportunity for China to take over, well, take over of the Hong Kong government and prevented more visible opposition than uh, before. And this is a student of the Royal Military College of Canada. Yeah, so I can answer the question about the Multi Alliance first. Um, I think uh, the, the, actually the emergence of Multi Alliance is quite interesting. It's in response to Chinese intimidation to a Thai um, artist who vowed his support to Hong Kong. And eventually it became uh, an internet, um, as the so-called internet uh, rebellions towards the, the internet trolls from mainland China, the, the so-called 50 cents, uh, all those uh, uh, like nationalistic patriotic um, uh, netizens from China. And that kind of like consolidation of the people from around the region, which symbolize themselves with their unique uh, drink, which is uh, each of their versions of a uh, milk tea, um, actually consolidates a virtual community that is surrounded by the pursuit of democracy and anti-Chinese nationalism bullying. And um, with the emergence of the Thai protest and the Burmese protest, it has become an amplifier for the cause from each of these regions so that um, with that virtual community, we have a sense of supporting each other. We have a sense and we'll, be, we'll, we'll possibly feeling a responsibility to speak up for our brothers and sisters in this uh, virtual identity. And I think that is powerful because, um, well, I, I, I've been there when you are protesting on the street and you are eager to be heard. And I think that uh, multi-alliance um, gluing us together that we help each of us to, to speak up for our demands and let more people to be aware of what's happening on, 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 on each of the protests. So I think it is, it's actually fascinating. Um, I've, I, I'm able to connect with a lot of Thai and, and Burmese activists just because we are part of the Multi Alliance and I'm privileged and glad that in certain ways I could help them to broadcast their ideas on Twitter and on other platforms. Thank you. And turning to Michael for the last question. Yes, on the pandemic, of course, there's a lot of speculation about that, that Xi Jinping wanted to seize the opportunity. We know there were problems on the Indian border, China, uh, Myanmar is sort of uh, supporting the military coup, uh, South China Sea, uh, threats towards Taiwan, the crackdown in Hong Kong, the Xinjiang. So it seems like uh, China is really has a full plate of aggressive behavior going on. They, they even claim their, their diplomats are wolf warriors. Uh, and so uh, was, was the pandemic cover for that? And China's tried to uh, use or propagandize its own approach to the pandemic, even though it has some problems with 
with the pandemic's origin that it was uh, its approach to addressing it was was better than democracies could manage and so it gets all kind of wrapped up in this uh, democracies versus versus autocracies debate uh, I, I think there's some truth to it I think uh, Xi Jinping uh, was being being very assertive uh, from the get-go internally in the country and uh, he apparently believes that repressive tactics are uh, better than uh, consultative tactics. And so I think he's he is uh, projecting a kind of the internal practices of China in its foreign relations abroad. Uh, and uh, it, but again, we can only speculate because it seems behaviorally consistent with that. And, and it is no doubt true that the pandemic has occupied leaders around the world. Thank you. There are many, many more questions, but on behalf of the Asian Studies Network and SIPS, I want to thank you both uh, for taking part in this discussion today. Like, uh, like we mentioned earlier, it is an important discussion. Hopefully we get to talk some more. We will be looking, reading your book, looking, uh, looking at the interviews, uh, following also Nathan's work and his Twitter where he is very active. So once again, thank you very much, Professor Davis and Nathan Law for joining us today. It was a very um, full and interesting discussion. Thank you very much.